So Q and A, I have the Q and A open. Yeah. And Shankar, I can help you manage the Q and A as well, and okay. I'll remind the attendees to submit their questions that way. Super. Are we ready? Uh, let's wait. Let's wait a couple minutes. So you're queuing when you're ready, right? Yes. Hi, Tandy. Hey, Shankar. Shankar, we can go ahead and start whenever you're ready. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to this edition of the colloquium of the C3 AI Digital Transformation Institute. It's uh, a special treat to welcome a distinguished economist and indeed a polymath uh, to our colloquium today. 
let me just tell you a little bit about uh, C3.ai. Uh, it's, uh, it's a newly established institute to really think about the use of AI and machine learning and more broadly digital transformation for transforming business, government and society. We believe that there's a new science and technology to be discovered here at the, uh, at the intersection of certainly of economics, but also public policy, machine learning, AI, IoT, and uh, more generally computing. Uh, it's a partnership of, uh, uh, funded by C3.ai and Microsoft, and it's a partnership of uh, Illinois, Berkeley, CMU, MIT, Princeton, University of Chicago, Stanford, and two national laboratories, the Supercomputing Lab, National Center for Superconducting Applications at the University of Illinois, and the Lawrence Berkeley Labs. Uh, this series has uh, been a wonderful forum already so far, and I just want to give you a sense of some of the forthcoming talks for August and September. We actually will have, have a full schedule all the way through December 10th, which is right before Christmas, and we'll be making this available newsletter. Next week will be Dimitri Bertsimas, also from MIT. Stefano Bertozzi uh, will speak on, uh, from Berkeley, will speak on August 20th. Asuos Daglar from MIT will speak on August 27th. Zoe Rapti from the University of Illinois will speak about spatial modeling. Vince Poor from Princeton will speak on September 10th. Uh, Sarah Bameen from MIT will speak on uh, reopening. Actually, even today's stock will have a great deal to do with reopening, and so you're in for a treat. Uh, certainly, all of the month of uh, August, September. Ryan Ghani from CMU will speak about fairness and machine learning. San Coelho will speak about uh, encrypted searches and sharing information. Cynthia Mulainathan and Zia Dobermeyer, Illinois. And Sorry, Chicago and Berkeley guys will speak about uh, machine learning for uh, triage with images. Jennifer Listgarden will speak about machine learning and bioinformatics. But today is uh, will be a wonderful talk on optimal target lockdowns for COVID-19 in a multi-group SIR model. Let me just to spend a few, uh, oh, and the format is a 40-minute presentation, 50-minute Q&A, uh, Camille uh, is uh, credited in uh, the monitoring your questions and the Q&A feature. You know, I noticed uh, some of you all who are here as guests, uh, you know, we, we see you all. You can please uh, feel free to upload questions, send us questions, and we'll try to answer as many as we can. Uh, a little bit about uh, Professor Ajimonyu. He is the Institute Professor, it's the highest uh, category at, uh, at MIT and he's a fellow of uh, the National Academy of Sciences, the Turkish Academy of Sciences, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. The Econometric Society, the European Economic Association, and the Society of Labor Economists. He is an extremely uh, distinguished economist with five books. Uh, Modern Economic Growth, Why Nations Fail, is certainly a classic, but there are uh, others, The Narrow Corridor of State of Society, and the fate of liberty with the, the two, these two with James Robinson, is uh, he is really a polymath in that his work covers many, many areas of economics and technology, networking, uh, AI, machine learning, uh, game theory, you just name it. He has contributed to this. He's extremely prolific. It's really a pleasure to read his work. He has been uh, extremely well recognized, the inaugural T.W. Schultz Prize from the University of Chicago in 2000. Or Distinguished Science Award from the Turkish Sciences Association, the John von Neumann Award from Wright College in Budapest, uh, the Carnegie Fellowship in 2017, the Jean-Jacques Lafont Prize in 2018, and the Global Economy Prize in 2019. I know he has not yet begun, but I, it's uh, safe for me to tell you that you're in for a treat. Thank you so much, Daron, and over to you. And please take over the screen. Thank you. Thank you, Shankar. Uh, it's uh, great to be here. Uh, thank you, Shankar and Shrikant and others for the invitation to be here. Uh, it's, ooh, it's again giving me the message that I cannot share. 
I think you have to stop share. Okay, yes. Now I can share. All right. Uh, well, uh, this is a great opportunity for me to be able to share my work. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think the uh, Institute has a great mission. And I see several lines of work that I'm doing to fit at the intersection of uh, uh, mathematical approaches and social, economic, and uh, and uh, and applied policy problems. So I think uh, it's it's certainly a great area uh, to be part of. But given the current situation, which has changed all of our lives, I'm not surprised that the next several months you're going to have talks on COVID-19 and that's what I'm gonna talk on also. So it's joint work with my colleague, Victor Chernozukov, uh, Ivan Werning and Mike Winston, optimal targeted lockdowns in a multi-group SIR model. Uh, essentially, this is a contribution to the policy analysis of COVID-19, which has already attracted a lot of attention. And so I'll try to motivate what's new here and why it's a worthwhile exercise. And the best way of doing that is to give a caricature of what has been done so far. There is a huge and very productive epidemiological literature on using large scale models and careful immunological and, uh, and, 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 and medical information on herd immunity, mitigation, timing, spread of the virus. There's an emerging econ literature on costs of lockdowns and, uh, uh, and, and how the economy is responding to it. And we see our work to fall at the intersection of these two. And in particular, there is a small strain of the econ literature, which is focusing on optimal policy. And, and this is where we are going to try to contribute as well. So we want to understand how it is that optimal policy can be characterized, understood in an environment where there is significant heterogeneity. And the reason why this is sort of a venerable econ question is because in much of uh, economics literature on policy, there is always a uh, push for better targeting. If you can target your policy, so, uh, so you know, if you are giving, for example, insurance, you would want to have that targeted towards different risk group or sort of different behavioral groups. And, uh, but generally, there is always a question as to whether targeting is really super beneficial and whether it's feasible. You know, it may not be feasible because you cannot identify the right groups or it could lead to very complex uh, sort of patterns that would be difficult to implement. Now, in the case of COVID-19, there is a prima facie case that this could be very beneficial. Because if you look at the patterns for COVID-19, which I think by now everybody knows, it's been characterized as two separate diseases. One that's sort of like a flu or even a mild flu for healthy and relatively young populations, and one that's extremely deadly and dangerous for populations with comorbidities and above a certain age. So for example, here I'm giving you the basic data. This is very similar from uh, South Korea and, uh, uh, and, and, and some European countries, but this is the US data. Over 65s have a mortality case fatality rate, which means conditional on infection, that's about 60 times higher than those between the ages of 20 and 49. If you go to 75s, that's like 100 times higher. So these asymmetric effects create the potential that targeting is going to be very useful. And we're also gonna show you that targeting can be very simple, but then that brings the uh, question to how do we actually think of optimal policy in SIR or multi-group SIR models, which is where, uh, where, where much of what I'm going to talk about come in. And in some sense, this is sort of familiar territory for many of you who uh, have backgrounds in mathematics, control theory, uh, machine learning, AI, 
so it's going to be about the modeling and and bringing a couple of tools and perspectives from different uh, different literatures together. So we're going to build a multi-group SIR or SEIR model. I'll limit the presentation to the SIR model for simplicity, so I won't distinguish exposed and infected. Uh, the model will be general, but the, when it comes to the application, I'm going to focus on young, middle-aged, and old, over 65, calibrate the parameters to COVID-19, and then really fo focus for most of the talk on comparing optimal control, how you compute optimal control in this setup, and then compare them with targeting and no targeting, which I'll also call uniform. So here is the bottom line. I'm going to show you that optimal targeted policies look simple, but bring large gains. And they have a nice economic and mathematical structure. Moreover, this, and herein comes the simplicity, most of the gains are going to come from simple, what we call semi-targeted policies. Just treat the most vulnerable group, 65 plus group, differentially in a protective custody. Uh, but there are still interesting between group interactions, which I'm going to get into. The most economical or simple way of summarizing the bottom line is with this figure. And I think this figure is also sort of a small conceptual step towards where, where I'm going. You know, it shows one way of approaching these problems at a high level, at a bird's eye view level, that you can think of really our objective is to minimize a combination of two things. One is excess death, which I'm gonna just simply refer to as death, and output loss. So zero is where you would be if you did not have COVID-19 or you had a perfect cure from the beginning. And unfortunately, that's not where we are. We have to put up with a lot of excess deaths over you know, 170,000 now in the US uh, and, uh, and quite a bit of output loss. And this frontier here is what is similar to what we call in economics a Pareto frontier. It sort of shows if you do the best that you can, so this is already optimal policy, what is the trade-off between these two things that you want to achieve, low deaths and low output loss? But here I'm doing what some of the sort of the implicit thinking in the literature was, which is uniform policies that applies to everybody. And the dashed line is essentially when you allow for targeted policies. Now at these two points, which are maximal control, which is you do the best that you can in order to minimize deaths at all costs and no control, which is you let the economy open up without any preventative measures from the first day, the two are gonna be the same because targeting is by definition not relevant in that space. But except as those two points, the dashed line lies below the solid line. <clears throat> so the trade-off improves significantly. And we're gonna show you that this is quantitatively true especially at the middle points here, you have a big gap between targeted and uniform policy. So I'm gonna to try to explain where this comes from, uh, where you'll get sort of the gains and what form optimal uniform and targeted policies take. One other point that we'll see already that this frontier is backward banding. Why? Because if you do no control whatsoever, that's really bad for deaths, but it's also gonna be bad for the economy. So that's a point that naturally comes up in the analysis. All right, a couple of caveats. You know, this is a mathematical analysis, although we're gonna to try to be realistic in the parameter choices, but we're not epidemiologists, epidemiologists and uh, there is a lot of uncertainty that's not our fault. There's a lot of uncertainty in the literature about model specification and parameters. So this is true in all of the studies. And in fact, uh, it's a pity that some of the early studies did not really emphasize this uncertainty. So optimal policy or even simple uh, policies and their consequences could be very sensitive to parameters or the ev evolution of the disease, which has been uh, quite complex in many ways. But 
what I'm going to show you is that even though the optimum is sensitive to parameters, the gain, the additional benefits that you get and the, some of the more structural properties are insensitive, relatively insensitive to parameters. So targeted policies always does quite a bit better than uniform policies. And the spirit of the presentation here is to share a few ideas and encourage others to delve in here because as I'll show you, uh, there are both many, many unanswered questions and lots of interesting policy avenues. And, and this is a very complex area. There is a lot more room for mathematical analysis. In fact, what I'm gonna show you is a lot of it is just based on quantitative analysis because explicit form solutions here are very difficult. All right, unless there are any questions, I'm happy to ask questions, to answer questions if people want to ask as I go along or wait for the Q&A uh, setting. So if, unless there are any questions, here is the plan model, uh, calibration, where the parameters come from, main results, and I won't have time, much time for robustness, but I'll show you just two things there. So here is the model. Essentially, the key equation of a standard SIR model is this. S is susceptible, I is infected, and new infections is some parameter beta times S times I. And beta stands for two things. It's one, the rate at which susceptible people come into contact with infected people, so it's a contact process, plus conditional on contact, what's the probability that a susceptible person gets the disease from an infected person. So we're gonna extend that, and this is a stylized representation of our model in a two group setting. So the, if you take the top of this, this would be just like the standard SIR model. The susceptible, they may get infected. Now in the context of the COVID-19, you may want to distinguish people who get infected and are severe, so need ICU versus non-ICU. And then people may not recover, especially those who need ICU may recover or may die. So this is like a standard uh, SIR model adapted to COVID. Instead, we're gonna allow multiple groups and the key is gonna be this red thing here, the network interactions between different groups. So people from I2 can infect S1 and so on. Mathematically, the, uh, that key equation is going to be replaced by the following equation. New infections in group J, are going to be SJ, the susceptible in group J, times infections in other groups multiply with the contact rate. So rho JK is the contact rate. So the, this takes up the part in the standard SIR model that was the contact rate. Beta then becomes infection conditional on contact. This could be group specific too. There is now more evidence than when we wrote the paper that there are some group specific differences in uh, in, in, in rate of infection conditional on contact, but we're gonna take that not to be group specific. Okay, so let me put a little bit of math into this. So there are gonna be J groups. Once you become infected, at that point, it's a result whether you have a mild one minus iota J for group J or severe ICU iota J. All infections resolve at the rate gamma J all mild recover and the ICU may recover or may die and we allow those to be time dependent. Why? Because recovery may require ICU care, including ventilators, and there may be a capacity constraint. So we allow the delta, del delta DJT, which is the death rate of those who need ICU from group J to be a function of the total ICU need. This could be a convex, it is a convex function, but it could be uh, it could also take the form of a very, very steep so that this constraint becomes a hard constraint in the form of you should never have the infections rise above a certain number. Uh, there could be testing and isolating here. Uh, Non-ICU people are tested and isolated at the rate tau j. Uh, we model that both in a little bit more in greater detail in the paper here. I'm not going to get into it. The ICU people, that's a different rate for them, phi J, since you go to the ICU, you're identified, but it's not perfect because you may infect other people in the ICU or nurses or doctors. But in any case, the overall non-isolation rate of an average 
uh, infection in group J is one minus iota J phi J plus one minus iota J tau J. Recovered agents are assumed to be immune. That's, there's a question mark on this, and we can talk about how to incorporate that, but I'm not going to do that today. And detected and separated can be uh, identified and perhaps more easily incorporated into labels. A key part of our model is the modeling of the lockdown, which is both, I believe, realistic and simple. So the simplicity is useful because, again, this is a prototypical model. Others hopefully can build on it. So we're going to assume that in each group, 1 minus L bar J of the employed fraction, 1, mi uh, one minus L bar J, are essential workers. So you're never going to be able to lock them down. They're nurses, they are delivery workers, they're doctors or uh, police officers, etc. So the, the lockdown parameter then is going to be between zero and L bar J. When you lock down an individual in group J that has an opportunity cost WJ, which could be the wage, this could be modeled in, uh, in more complex ways. And we talk about that in the paper, but I'm not going to do that here. And this is very important. The effectiveness of the lockdown is going to be imperfect. Either people come into contact even when they are in lockdown because of uh, surface transmission, or they have to go out for shopping or deliveries, etc. Or more straightforwardly, some people are going to disobey the lockdown. So theta j is how effective is the lockdown? So therefore, when uh, when the lockdown parameter is l j, the fraction of interacting infections is going to be one minus theta j times l j. So if Lj was equal to 1, which means you lock down everybody, then this will be 1 minus theta j. Say, for example, if theta j was 0.75, which is what we're going to take in our baseline, that would mean that out of every four people you lock down, one of them is going to fully break the lockdown and, and interact and infect them. Okay? I'm going to uh, assume that a cure and a vaccine arise at time t, which is stochastic. But for to today's talk, I'm going to take that to be one and a half years time. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm happy to talk about what happens when it's stochastic, but it's easier to understand things when it's deterministic. All right, summary. This is the model. Now I have expanded this new infections in group J. Two things are new here. One is that Instead of rho jk, I put rho jk times eta k. Why? Because some of the people who are infected are not coming into contact because they are isolated. And then you have 1 minus theta j lj times sj, because out of the susceptible population, some of them are in lockdown, so they're not going to get the virus. But also importantly, inside the summation here, you have 1 minus theta k lk, because some of the people in the infected category in group k are locked down. So this already shows you that lockdown is going to have a potentially large effect because it has an exponential nature, a quadratic nature, just like the matches. So that's part of where the power of lockdown comes in. Now, this is, of course, based on a specific modeling of the uh, matching process. And in the paper, we discuss alternative matching technologies and under what circumstances one versus another applies. But let me, again, in the talk, I'm going to simplify things. And, and focus on this. Now, as I said and hinted at in the introduction, we have two objectives. One is lives lost. We want to minimize excess deaths. So that's the total number of deaths by time cap T when the vaccine and cure arrive across groups. All groups are treated equally here. And then economic losses, which is the total losses of uh, output because of lockdowns and other things. Now, this is the equation here. I'm not going to go through it, uh, but let me tell you what it consists of. It consists of the WJ that I pointed out is the opportunity cost, except that we allow for work from home. So not everybody who works, who is in lockdown, loses completely their output. There you get one minus, uh, you lose one minus psi J of it. So that's the efficiency of homework for some subgroups. But secondly, you also have this last term here, which is that if somebody dies, all of their future output is lost. So that's our way of capturing both the disruptions and the uh, foregone opportunities for production due to the COVID-19 
disruption and excess deaths. And that's the reason why, as I showed you, if you do no control, the frontier actually becomes backward bend. All right, so that's the summary, the theoretical summary. Now, before going into the results and parameters and the results, let me actually show you one <clears throat> theoretical result or theoretical representation. Well, first of all, better targeting or better tailoring is going to have benefits because it's going to enable the lockdowns to be targeted or tailored for the old that have greater vulnerability. So therefore, allow lower lockdown for the young. But there's a more subtle reason why targeting may sometimes be very useful. And I'll come back to this again when we put some numbers into it. And that's because of the form of herd immunity, if you're going to reach herd immunity. And again, it may well be that optimal policy is very far from herd immunity. I'll show you both herd immunity and non-herd immunity policies. And one way of understanding this is by considering this picture, which is going to illustrate both what I mean by herd immunity policies and non-herd immunity policies, which I'll come back to in the numerical quantitative results, but also explain what this benefits of targeted herd immunity are. So consider here a two group model so that I can represent it in this picture. This one is the susceptible population of the young. This one is a susceptible population of the old. The society starts at 1-1. Everybody is susceptible at the beginning or near 1-1. One, one. And if there is no intervention, we travel along the 45 degree line showed by the dashed line. Because given that I've assumed that the two groups have, uh, <clears throat> have the same infection rate conditional on matches, and if I normalize that their matching rates are the same without any uh, targeting of, of policy or other heterogeneities, you're going to move along this 45 degree line. But you won't go all the way down to zero, zero, because there is this area which I'm calling, which we're going to call following the epidemiology literature, the herd immunity, which is essentially the basin of attraction of the continuum of steady states that could be limit points of this area. So essentially, these all there, there's a continuum of limits, uh, possi possible steady states here. And all of these steady states are going to have the infection disappearing. And in, in this herd immunity region, the infection disappears because once the susceptible population is low enough, then there isn't enough transmission and the inspection, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the virus dies down. Crucially, once you enter into this green area, quickly the infection dies down, but you don't stay where you are. You still travel inside it. Okay, so that's why there is something called overshooting in this model, which I can come back to later on. But the point that I want to make here is that, well, not all herd immunities are uh, created equal. So if you follow this 45 degree line, you enter the herd immunity, but with a, lo a lot of deaths because the old group is getting a lot of infection. But there are, with different controls, you can actually enter herd immunity region with different protection given to old groups. So that's actually another important conclusion that comes out from this multi-group things. So control actually determines not only whether you get into herd immunity or not, how you get into herd immunity and how much overshooting you do. So we're gonna come back and see many of these points in the quantitative, all of them we could see, but I'm not gonna have time to discuss all of them. And then finally, you also now see what I mean by herd immunity and no herd immunity policies, which this latter I'm gonna call waiting for vaccine policies. And since I'm gonna use this terminology quite a bit in the next 10 minutes, let me explain. So imagine that we are just following this black arrow here. We could follow it at varying speeds. That's going to be determined by this intensity of the lockdown. If the lockdown is not very intense, by time T, when the cure and the vaccine come, we will already be in the green area. That means we would have reached herd immunity. The vaccine is still useful, but actually the disease was going to come to an end already. Or we could slow down the travel along this arrow. It doesn't need to be linear either. The arrow could be curved, but we could slow the tra travel such that when time T comes, we're somewhere here. That would be a waiting for the vaccine strategy. We're not going into the herd immunity region. We're taking things slow so that the vaccine comes and saves us. So those are the two things I'm going to contrast. 
Okay, let me pause for one minute and see, or 30 seconds and see if there are any clarifying questions or any questions I should take on now. If not, let me jump to the next 10, 15 minutes. So since time is short, let me not spend much time on the parameter calibration. We choose pretty much everything with a few exceptions to be very standard. The age mortality rates are from Ferguson et al, which match the US and uh, South Korean data very closely. We choose group sizes and earnings from the US data. The beta parameter is chosen such that the initial reproduction rate is 2.4. Now that's actually requires some debate, discussion. The initial R0 of this disease, and that's why you know, this disease was known to be extremely, extremely dangerous from the first week of January, making it completely mysterious how the CDC didn't do anything for the next three months that the first data that came out from China showed an R0 of over three, which is just an incredible spread. It's very, very, very high for a disease that has a mild mortality, you know, medium mortality like this one. The later data suggests R0 is lower partly because people are taking precautions, washing hands, wearing face masks, being more careful. <coughs> now for a study like this, it's hard to know what you should choose. So we chose R0 to be the same as what people believed to be a conservative estimate in early March. So Ferguson et al. used similar numbers. So that implies a beta of 0 0.134. Actually, in the US, the, R, the implied R0 right now is lower. So some of our mortality numbers are higher for that reason. The second thing I want to say is that we're going to choose the interaction patterns to be given by the uniform 111 matrix. Why? Because I want to show you, as I show you later, when you take the interaction patterns to be asymmetric, there are additional effects that are very interesting and very important, but I want to show you the structure of the model without them, just for clarity, and then I'll add them later. Uh, and then the ca capacity effects, we match them to, we take them to match the Italian data, uh, but these may be a little bit too aggressive. Again, we do a lot of robustness on this, doesn't really matter too much for anything qualitative, but a few numbers do depend on that. Very low testing and isolation in the US. We calibrate those from the basic data that comes to ADA J.0.9. And then the most important number, which I'll show you, well, I probably won't because I don't have time, but it's when we do theta J is equal to 0 0.75. And then we take 30% of the young and the middle-aged workers to be essential. Okay. Uh, cost of death, we again follow the literature here. And as I said, the baseline based vaccine comes in one and a half years. All right, <clears throat> here are the results. This is what we're going to build up to, but you can think of this as the final product or the initial picture I'm showing you on which I'm going to build. This is the empirical equivalent of the Pareto frontier that I showed you. On the horizontal axis, I have deaths, except that I have now expressed them as a fraction of the adult population. On the vertical axis, I have output loss, except that, again, to make it easier to process, I have expressed that as present discounted value of total losses as a fraction of one year's GDP. This is slightly misleading, and uh, perhaps in the next version, we'll do that differently. What this means is that we're taking the losses for a year and a half and we're benchmarking them to one year's GDP. So these are not like how much of a year's recession there is for two reasons. First of all, it's one and a half years of losses. And secondly, it also has the disruption costs coming from debts. So that's why it's not like the size of the US recession, but I'll give it to you what the equivalent uh, size of US recession implied would be. So the red curve is the equivalent of the uniform policy one that I showed. So let me first explain the red curve, and then I'm going to contrast that to what happens when you have targeted policy, which is the equivalent of, again, what I showed you in the introduction. So one 
reason for why we like this picture is because it really summarizes a lot of information. It's conceptually, I think, the right way of looking at it. Because sometimes people give you some ad hoc policies and you don't know whether those policies work or not, whether they're making some systematic mistakes. Sometimes people then in some other settings will say, here is the optimal policy, but optimal according to whose preferences? Donald Trump's preferences, Joe Biden's preferences, median voters' preferences, CDC's preferences. So it's much better to show what's the menu of trade-offs are, and then you can choose whatever point you like best. But of course, to show you how the form of the optimal policy does, I can't just limit myself to the frontier. So now I pick a point, I'm gonna pick this red dot here. What is this red dot? This is the point that says, what is the optimal policy subject to the constraint that deaths should not exceed 0.2% ex exceed of the adult population? Okay, let me call that safety focused. Or we could take one that says, losses should not exceed 10% or output loss. Okay. So here is in the top panel, I'm showing you the safety focused and in the bottom panel, I'm showing you the economy focused optimal uniform policy. Since it's uniform, there is a single lockdown. And the lockdown policy, which applies to all three groups, is shown here. It's a fairly aggressive lockdown. It starts a little bit low, but it quickly rises to above 50% of the economy. And then it hovers around 40% for about a year. And it only starts coming down about two months before the arrival of the vaccine. Why does it start coming down two months before the arrival of the vaccine? Because once you know the vaccine is around, that gives you insurance. The reason why you lock down is to stop the exponential growth. And I'm gonna show you that in a clearer fashion in a second. But then when you know that in two months, the vaccine is gonna come, so it's gonna take the punch bowl in the middle of the party, then you say, okay, fine. It's fine for us to sort of start relaxing the lockdown even before the vaccine comes. Now, one way of seeing that quite clearly is to look at this picture, which shows the infection rates by three groups, but they are also on top of each other because again, we simplified the problem by assuming that the three groups have the same infection rates conditional on contact, and I took a contact matrix that's uniform. So the infection rate peaks at some point, that's usual again, but it, the peak never reaches very high level. And then it hovers at very, very low level, but then it starts trending up here. So there's another, like a second wave just before the uh, vaccine comes. Why is that? Well, that's the result of this relaxation here, and it's a telltale sign that there is no herd immunity. How can you tell there's no herd immunity? Because when you relax the lockdown, immediately infections pick up. So this looks good because we're actually keeping infections low more than flattening the curve, but it has a cost. And the cost is that the economic loss over a year and a, year and a half is about 37% about of one year's GDP. Much of that comes from output loss due to lockdown. So you have something like a 20% recession as a result of this policy, not very appetizing. What if you said we go for protecting the economy? Then the optimal policy is plotted here. You see that it's a much shorter lockdown. You still want to have a lockdown because you want to flatten the curve because of the convex mortality picture and the early exponential growth is very costly for that. But you completely, you, you sort of start winding it down in about uh, <clears throat> five months. So it's again, not very short, but in about seven months, you completely get rid of the lockdown. As a result, on the same scale as the previous picture, the peak infection rate is much, much higher, about uh, seven times as high. But here is the telling thing. Now, there is no pickup in infection rates before the vaccine comes. Why? Because we have reached herd immunity here. 
So this is a telltale sign that now there is herd immunity, there's no herd immunity here. So this one is a waiting for the vaccine strategy. This is one is a herd immunity strategy. What's the downside? Well, we keep the economic losses low, but now the fatalities come to above 1%. <laughs> I, here I also show you the fraction infect, uninfected and the reproduction rate, sort of, but let me skip that. Let me now show you what happens if you do a particularly simple form of targeting, which we call semi-targeting. Treat the young and the middle-aged the same, and just treat the oldest group, which has the highest mortality rate, potentially differential. So we compute optimal policy, again, for the safety focused and the economy focused. Now there are two lines, one that applies to middle-aged and young, and one that applies to, uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the older group. Bottom line, you have a much greater control over the older group. You can think of it as a protective custody. You still don't let the young and the middle aged go and party and work and uh, go on Florida beaches. Why not? Well, because the two groups are still interacting. Given that theta is 0 0.75, if this group gets infected, that gets translated into the older, more vulnerable group's mortality rate. So that's why it's very important that you still have this fairly draconian lockdown, even if less draconian so, than before. But now, because you can distinguish these two groups, even this lockdown is less costly and, and you keep the mortality at the same rate, but the economic losses are one third lower, about 24%. If you went for the economy focused one, it's the same story. Now with the 10% loss, you can reduce for fatalities to less than 0.5%, so a big gain. <laughs> I'm gonna conclude with a few more points. I wanna focus on the qualitative point. The first one that I wanna make is that this is the uh, semi-targeted policy and the basis of my claim that in this case, targeted policy can be achieved very simply. What if you did full targeting? Now you're gonna do different lockdowns for the middle age and you can add more groups and you can do more fine tune, but the gains are minimal. Why on earth are the gains minimal? Generally, when you do targeting, you know, fine tuning may be useful, but if fine tuning is not useful, the beginning of the targeting wasn't very useful. But here there's a very different logic. The reason is that, the reason why targeting helps is because you're protecting the old. And the way to do that is you protect the old by taking them under protective custody while at the same time slowing down the spread of the infection among the younger group. But you're not doing that to protect the young really. And that's the reason why semi-targeting, you know, you don't improve much on semi-targeting because, you know, when you do this, you're doing it a little bit more for the younger than the middle-aged group, but the whole point was slow down the infections within this group so it doesn't spill over to the other group. And that's not going to be changed with this logic and, 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 and doing it just locking down the young and the middle-aged at the same rate was essentially optimal. Now, one other question you can ask is whether the reason why you are locking the old is because they have lower economic participation already or because they're more vulnerable. So to, do that, to look into that, we split the old into old working and old not working. And the answer is it's got nothing to do with their lower economic participation. If you have old working and old not working, you lock down both groups because it's always because of this protective custody. And then we do a lot of things to look at the robustness of these results and to improve over these results. Let me say two more words on that. One is you can improve over these results a lot, A, with testing and isolation, and our model helps you sort of target that as well. And two, uh, group distancing helps a lot, which means that you actually reduce, say, nursing home visits or reduce uh, interactions between older and younger populations by having different opening hours of supermarkets and restaurants, et cetera, for different age groups. Why? Because again, the problem is the infections are going to spread faster within the younger population. You don't want it to go to the older group. So there are uh, <clears throat> important lessons there. And we can do a lot of the things that 
the epidemiology literature does. And most importantly, we can put like hard constraints on go and revisit some of the conclusions of the Ferguson et al story. And the most important thing is that Whatever you do, it's very difficult to get optimal policy to have two ways. So even if you put hard constraints, which Ferguson et al. and some of the epidemiology literature suggested as the reason why you may want, you may need to have two waves, it's never optimal to have two waves. So two waves, so the, the disease dies down and then comes back, is typically a failure of policy, not part of optimal policy. And then the final thing, I'll show you is that you can also uh, <clears throat> put more realistic matching matrices. So here we do the BBC pandemic. There are a little bit more interesting patterns that come out here, but the overall conclusion is the same. You have a huge shift of the Pareto frontier. Semi-targeting achieves almost all of the gains and quantitatively and qualitatively is much better to do the targeting. Let me stop here and take questions. Thanks for uh, listening. Uh, Daron, that was a, uh, a fantastic uh, talk. Uh, if I can, uh, you cannot stop your video. Okay. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, Daron, that was a fantastic talk. Um, and let me ask you, you know, while we are waiting for questions to come into the Q&A box, let me ask you, uh, so the, the results are just fantastic. They are really, uh, you know, they mirror uh, what, uh, you know, they really give proof to a lot of the uh, uh, assertions that are being made. But can, can, can you talk a little bit about the technology of the, you certainly showed the results, but in terms of the mathematics that goes into this and the, and the qualitative, sort of the qualitative story, what is your sense of, uh, uh, you know, not only for COVID, you know, but what else have you seen that uh, has similar mathematics, I think is really... Right, so I think I should say a couple of things there. So first of all, <clears throat> SIR models are beautiful, but they're not the easiest models to work with, as people know. The fact that you have these uh, continuum of steady states and it's a fairly nonlinear dynamics makes them not the nicest thing to work with. Uh, so there are some special cases of SIR models that have explicit form solutions, but we're not working with those cases because they're not the most realistic. Uh, so in other work, I am working on uh, sort of more qualitative characterization of optimal policy. So I think that's a really important thing to understand the structural properties here. So here we do a little bit of characterization. We simplify the problem uh, with, uh, with with actually a sort of a small integration by parts helps. And then, and then we use, uh, you know, numerical methods to do the optimal control. So this version of the mod, this version of the SIR model doesn't allow much progress. So there are two cases in which you can make more progress. One is if you indeed impose hard constraints and get rid of the convexity, then under some conditions, you may be able to get in, uh, some characterization of optimal control. And then the other one that you may be able to do, which we have, we have made some progress on, is if you get rid of convexity and the hard constraints and impose all of them as a cost at the end of the horizon. So as a co convex cost on overall infections rather than the time path of infections, then you may be able to get, and then that gives actually some nice insights, but it's not exactly the standard model that uh, the epidemiology literature uses. Fantastic. Let me get, get to the questions. Uh, one, I think they may be from people that you know. One, the first one from John Burge, University of Chicago. How might the results change if you include excess deaths from lockdowns? Example, income loss, unemployment, uh, healthcare lockdown. That's a great question. That's a fantastic question. I think that's actually very, very important. You know, I think this has been a very, very difficult uh, process for many people for many reasons. Uh, but it's also been a very challenging to think about policy trade-offs here because, you know, on the one hand, you're dealing with, you know, 
human lives. But on the other hand, lockdowns have really terrible consequences, especially on low income communities, on children from low income communities, on people with uh, you know, income problems, health problems, socioeconomic problems. So I think all of those are very, very challenging things to take into account. We did not incorporate them for one very specific reason, because we didn't want to appear to be saying in this paper, in implicitly or explicitly, that somehow lockdowns were a bad thing. We wanted to characterize the uh, frontier and the arguments that actually, you know, economic losses have uh, have health consequences, etc., were being made at the time uh, by people who were sort of anti-lockdown in some sense, and we didn't want to get into those issues. But I think they are actually first order, and they're very easy to incorporate into this analysis. Essentially, if they are, if you put them in terms of like linear costs, actually, it just changes where you are along that frontier. Uh, so the frontier actually doesn't change. But if you put them as convex costs, it actually changes the shape of the frontier a little bit. But the numerical methods that we have developed uh, are actually very flexible, so they can very, very easily deal with those. Fantastic. Uh, next question from Ozan Kantogan, I think, uh, Northwestern. The yes, model Ozan, has I, know, an... I know very well as well. <laughs> the model has an effectiveness compliance parameter theta j. And it seems that the model predictions would be different if in every period, every member of group J complies with probability theta J versus the fraction of the group J that never complies. So Absolutely. that either model assumes the formula. The latter Absolutely. will be equivalent to assuming a larger fraction of essential workers in the models. What, how would the policy implications change if there is right. explicit non-compliance? Great, thank you, Ozan. That's 100% right. And you are also absolutely right that for part of the story that I told, you know, some people may disobey. You don't want the uh, <clears throat> independent theta j draw every period. So essentially what we're assuming is that if there are four people who are being locked down at each instant, one of them is randomly chosen without memory to be out of lockdown. But if it is that, you know, Ozan himself doesn't lock the lockdown and doesn't like to wear masks, then it's a persistent process. Now, the reason why we do it this way is because otherwise the state space gets much larger. And, uh, and since, you know, conditioning on that information didn't seem like a, it would be either simple or feasible optimal policy, we thought that keeping the, uh, the state space low was, a, uh, was, 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 was actually tr for important for tractability. That was a small price to pay, but you are absolutely right, Ozan. I think that would be a very interesting thing to investigate, even if you don't condition mm -hmm. on that information of whether you're a complier or not in sending people back to work, the dynamics would be different because there would be this state dependent process of who is continuously infecting other people. Those people are going to actually get infected earlier and become immune earlier. So this is actually a very interesting, and there are a couple of new papers now on this topic. There's a very nice math paper that I saw just a couple of weeks ago. The model, this heterogeneous models behave very differently and very interestingly when there are uh, heterogeneous infection rates. And the reason for that is you can think of it as like, if there are super spreaders here, the super spreaders are also going to get immunity very early on. So then the super, super, super spreaders are going to drop out. So the early R0 is going to be very different than later R0, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So there are some very interesting issues. Again, we're sort of avoiding all of those because I wanted to focus on sort of the, the targeting aspect, but they are very, very first order. Thanks, Ozan. Uh, yeah, well, one more question from Ozan. Uh, you know, as you may know, uh, Daron, uh, there was a paper by John and Ozan. Yes, of course, very nice paper. Which was featured. Uh, in this. So I, I, I know there's another question, but I, before I get to Tamer's question, I want to give you the second of Ozan's question. How would the takeaways change for some groups, for example, the old, endogenously stay at home, even in the absence of, lo of lockdowns? That's another perfect, fantastic question, Ozan. Thank you. I should have mentioned that. And uh, <clears throat> so what we are characterizing is the optimal lockdown which should be considered which should be interpreted as the sum total of voluntary social distancing and regulated social distancing. 
then once you know this, you can ask the question, which is first order. We discussed it a little bit in the paper, but I didn't have time to get into it right now. Can we implement that? And the implementation question is far from obvious because even if I am high risk group, I actually do not internalize all of the external effects that I'm creating because of the sort of the usual nature of this, uh, <clears throat> of this, of this disease. And to add to that, there are some recent surveys by a team from Harvard, for example, which actually shows that the older individuals in the United States are much more optimistic about the risk of infection and death than younger individuals. So there are clearly a disconnect between people's beliefs and the actual data. So all of those really complicate, you know, how much of this can be achieved and how best it can be achieved with voluntary distancing, voluntary social distancing. To add to that, I have a new paper with Asu as Daglar Ali Maktoumi and Azarak uh, Malekian showing that voluntary social distancing itself also responds to testing and other policies in counterintuitive ways. So that really complicates, you know, what you can achieve with voluntary social distancing, but it's a very, very important area to investigate. Thank you, Ozan. Fantastic. Uh, great answers too. Uh, Tamek from University of Illinois. How do you incorporate, I'm, I'm reading it, I, I know Daran, you can see it, but I'll read it for the audience. How can you incorporate into your modeling framework the fact that the younger population could be carriers, that is asymptomatic, without moving into the infected segment of the population? So that's Sorry, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't hear that, Shankar. Can... Uh, how can you incorporate into your modeling framework the fact that the younger population could be carriers asymptomatic carriers without moving into the in infected segment of the population. Uh, I see. So thank you, Tamer. Uh, actually, <clears throat> uh, that doesn't change things very much because uh, in the SIR model, you know, you have the infected group and I didn't really condition so much on whether they are symptomatic or asymptomatic. So the theta J already captures that in a reduced form manner. Of course, the more uh, satisfactory way of doing that, and we do that in the paper, is to do the SEIR model, exposed, infected, and, 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 and recovered. And then you allow the exposed period to be differential across asymptomatic and symptomatic individuals, and the exposed and infected can have differential matching rates. So we, we, we show how to do that, and we show that the results are very similar, but that's another very interesting question. Thank you. Uh, Camille, uh, it says that you would like to answer uh, to, to answer this. Is that uh, uh... no, no? Thank you, Shankar. I'm just uh, helping to moderate the chat. Um, but I think that that's uh, all the questions that we had at least submitted uh, so far. Uh, okay, Srikanth, I think you wanted to have the last question, so uh, the floor uh, is yours, Srikanth. Actually, I think between John and Ozan and Tamer, I think they asked most of the questions that I wanted to ask, but let me ask a, a broad question. I mean, uh, um, I mean, this is not mathematical, but, but I guess when you do targeted lockdowns, especially either, I think John talked about, John Birch talked about uh, uh, targeting by geographical region, and then you're talking about targeting by age group. Uh, somehow some incentives have to be provided, right? I mean, if you ask some people not to work, and, and then that other people are allowed to work. What do you, as an economist, what would you do, I guess, to, to uh, uh, help people follow those rules? Right, so that's a very, very good, good question, Shang, uh, Shrikant. So <clears throat> one way to do that is actually do it by sector. So the continuous L would correspond to different sectors opening up. And in fact, there is an additional gain that a new paper by a group of economists investigates because different sectors have different contact rates. So there you have an, it doesn't turn out to be very big, but you have an additional gain in opening some sectors ahead of others. And that's actually also the logic of the essential workers. So you open the essential workers first, and then you open delivery workers and, uh, and other groups, but uh, uh, the tourism industry bars and, the, uh, and beaches you open last. So that would be a sort of a smooth way of doing it. It still doesn't resolve the incentive issues, but it's certainly one way of making that a little bit more granular. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, by the way, I, I know that we are at the end of our time, but 
uh, that I want to tell everybody in the audience about what you know the papers that you've been writing in these last several months are just fantastic, and I know you've discovered one. And uh, yeah, congratulations on really a fantastic output, and and it's a spectacular result. I have to say, I wish, uh, as you said, uh, the political debate is informed by your uh, by your. Pictures. I hope you're advising all campaigns so far. Oh, uh, no, no, I'm <laughs> staying away. Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. It was great. Thanks Thank uh, to Thank Shrikant, Shankar, much. Ozan, Tamer for the questions, John. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye.